we were born as proof we were born if this proof is not enough. What about within our Christian lives? When we think of that new birth, the second birth, however you want to term it, we are talking not just about the experience of that moment when we give our lives to Jesus. We are actually talk, we need to think about what happens in the rest of our lives. We place a lot of emphasis on when did you become a Christian? Essentially, that question, when did you become a Christian, is just the same as if we were to frame our birth certificate and put it up in our living room to pride of place. It's not just about that moment we become a Christian. In fact, that is just the beginning of our journey as a disciple of Jesus. In much the same way that when we are born, it is the beginning of our journey as a human. We don't go back and talk about our birth. Partly we don't remember it. But often it's, it's, pain, it's a painful experience, so I'm told, for the mum. And often for the baby as well. Indeed, having watched Hannah be born, I thought, goodness me. But I don't go back and talk about it. We don't talk about it with Hannah because we know it's happened and she is alive and we are bringing her up. In the same way, when we are born again as a Christian, when we give our lives to Jesus in that moment, it's about what happens afterwards. Yes, it's a critical moment, but it's what happens afterwards. It's very tempting to focus on that one moment and go, well, when, 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 when did you become a Christian? When's your Christian birthday? And Western culture makes it hard because we're so often tempted to think that way rather than actually focusing on what is God doing now and what is God about to do. God is not about a wonderful spiritual experience, leaving us with that warm, fuzzy feeling inside. That's not what God is about. Yes, of course, the spiritual experiences are great. But what are we actually seeking? What does those moments actually do to us as a person? Hopefully, they change us by encountering the living God. What matters is that it happens, but we don't dwell on it. We look at how that then leads through into how we live our life. In the church, there are those that question, do you really know Jesus? And they focus so much on, do you know Jesus, that perhaps they forget that they need to look at themselves first, and do they actually know Jesus? The church has become such a place where Jesus is left out of the equation. That the church has become the church of man and not the church of God. What we should be doing is not focusing on who knows Jesus. Do we know Jesus? Is he at the center? Of course he's at the center. He's at the center of everything. But what we should be focusing on is where are those signs of life in the church? Where are those little bits of life? And how can we nurture those as we move forward? Because when we are doing that, we're looking to see where the Holy Spirit is at work. Because that's God at work. It's Jesus at work. And we are nurturing that to bring that to fruition, whatever that may be. So in many ways, we need to take our eyes off the church as a building, as a gathering on a Sunday morning. And we need to have our eyes fixed on Jesus. The, when Jesus and Nicodemus meet and they talk, about each, they talk about faith, it's really important that we consider the context of that conversation that happens. Because the Judaism that they both knew meant it was important to be born into the right family. For them, it was being born into the family of Abraham. Nicodemus himself knows the scriptures. He's a Pharisee. He's teaching the scriptures. But does he truly know Jesus? A couple of weeks ago, there was a conference here uh, from the, the Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship. And the speaker was saying, actually, there are lots of people that believe in the Bible. He said, the people who killed Jesus believed in the Bible. Obviously, it wasn't as the Bible at that time, but the Hebrew scriptures as it was. 
But the problem is, they didn't know Jesus. It's not, a, it's not enough to just say we believe in this book. We have to say we believe in this book because we believe in Jesus. For us as Christians, we're not born into the family of Abraham as such. But when we give our lives to Jesus, we are born into the family of God, which is the best family in heaven and on earth, because there is nothing that can destroy that family. We know all too well in this society that family life is under pressure, that family life is troubled, that family life is divided, that things go wrong, relationship breakdown. All of that happens in a family. Now, yes, of course there is relationship breakdown in the church. I know that. Just look at the Church of England at the moment. But, but we, as the family of God, are united by far more than blood. We are united by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us, which enables us to proclaim Jesus is Lord, to give us access to the Father. We are united as a family, bringing the best out of each other, seeking each other's gifts to see what is it that you can give to the church? What is it that you can give? What is it that you can do to nurture your faith and nurture your relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And it's about knowing that we are not all the same. We are not all called to stand up here and preach. We are not all called to stand at the back and run the tech. We are not all called to make the tea and coffee. We are not all called to the children's work. We are all called to whatever it is that God is asking of us. A few years ago, Charles gave me a book All about saying we need to nurture the gifts that we have because we already have in the church what we need to grow and nurture as a church. One of the the testimonies in that book talks about somebody who had, I think it was a minibus, and he started going around and collecting people to bring them to church who couldn't get to church on their own. And I think by two or three years later, they had a whole bus or a couple of buses to collect people to bring them to church. Or because somebody said, I've got a minibus, what can I do? Hang on, that harks back to a few weeks back. What outrageous thing is God asking you to do? What have you got in your possession at home? What do you own that actually you need to start using for the glory of God? What is it that the Holy Spirit is saying to you? Well, yeah, you know that thing that's at the back of your cupboard gathering dust? Well, actually, if you bring that out and use it, I will use that for my glory. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit as the wind that comes. We don't know where it's from. We don't know where it goes. In many ways, our prayer should be that the Holy Spirit comes as the wind or as the fire and disrupts our lives. The Holy Spirit needs to come and disrupt all of our neat little paths of life, of knowing this is my life, this is where it's going, this is what I know. We need the Holy Spirit to come and either burn it or or blast it away with the wind. Because the church has become too much about what can we get from it. Is it right for me? I was put onto a book by Nigel called Set Me on Fire, and I'm just going to read a a short part of this. It says this. It's this, it's this Jesus who we read about in the Gospels. I, re- I recently, that's the author Malcolm MacDonald, recently read through the whole New Testament in bigger chunks than I have ever read before. Something that struck me powerfully is how costly living out the Christian faith really is. In Britain, we spend our lives seeking safety, ease, and comfort. Yet the church I read about in the New Testament ran towards sacrifice, servanthood, and risk. What is our goal in life? Getting our needs met or laying our lives down? We've somehow squared a circle that allows us to avoid any sacrifice that seems too extreme or too costly. Some Christians can't even commit to coming to church to meet their family, 
more than once every few weeks. That's quite, oh, it smacks you right in the chest. Is our church about taking risk? Is our church about living our faith? Or is our church about coming to, for our own needs to be met? Jesus, when he is talking to Nicodemus, is telling him about the Holy Spirit. It's setting up the rest of the gospel. Because the baptism, when, we are, when we become a Christian, we receive the Holy Spirit. It is new life bubbling up from within us. And as we explore the Letton Hall in Ephesians, we are continually filled with the Holy Spirit, which is not a one-time thing. Be continually filled. It's a present tense. It's something we need to keep doing to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can nurture that new life and become more and more like Jesus and so that the church reflects Jesus and not ourselves. The point in this passage is to see that the birth of the baptism of water and spirit brings two things. The baptism of water gives us new life of the spirit welling up like a spring inside of us. And the spirit baptism shows that we are required for membership in God's kingdom. Now we have, they are this one and the same. When we are baptized, we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are baptized with water to symbolize God. Baptizing, um, baptizing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Trinitarian baptism. It's one of the few times that the Trinity is mentioned in the Bible. Go and make disciples of all nations. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is required for membership in God's kingdom. To receive Jesus Christ. To receive the Holy Spirit. And then to know that we are part of that family by receiving the Holy Spirit. We can't get into the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Because when God's kingdom comes, it throws everything open. And the Spirit then is on the move. We need to catch what the Spirit is doing to enable us to grow as a church. If we are looking for signs of life, we need to be looking for what the Holy Spirit is doing so that it can be nurtured and that fire can be fanned into flame. As it was pointed out this morning, we have a fan into flame. Symbolic. We need to get, make sure that we are not squashing that fire of God within our lives because we're too afraid or too scared to go out of our comfort zone and do what God is actually asking of us. So my second question this morning, perhaps it's a deeper question than how do you know you're born, what is God asking of you at the moment? What, what needs to be fanned into flame in your life so that you can become fully ready to do what God is asking of you? Because I think until the church catches that fire, we ain't going anywhere. We'll just limp along as we are doing. Because the church is in such a mess because we have made all of these man-made rules and institutionalized it and made it into something human that we are essentially, in my view, quashing what the Spirit can actually do. And we need a move of the Holy Spirit to come and basically shake the church up. We need picking up, shaking up, getting rid of all of the rubbish that we have put into the church and allowing the Holy Spirit to say, this is what the church should be like. The church of servanthood, the church of risk, the church of faith, not the church of lovely songs. I know it's sometimes a good talk and all the fancy lights and tech. If we're not going to listen to that, then we're not ready for what God is on going to do. So are we feeling like we're on fire for God at the moment? Or are we feeling a bit flat? if we're honest, and just going through the motions. It's Sunday, we go to church. What needs to happen to get out of that place of feeling flat, to be into that place where we are full of the Holy Spirit? What do we need to do? It's quite simple. It's quite simple. We need to ask God for more of the Holy Spirit. We need to ask God to be filled 
with the Spirit once again. We need to ask God to set his church on fire. And when I use church in that sense, that means me and you. It does not mean the four walls, or eight, because I think we're an octagon, aren't we? Or whatever, however many walls we've got here. It means asking God to ignite our passions within us that can be used for his glory. That's part of the conversation, I think, between Jesus and Nicodemus. He's essentially saying, leave behind what you know, because God is about to shake things up. God is about to do something. Of course, we know that a few years later, Pentecost happens. We celebrated it last week. We know that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all of us. If we can have that slide up, Emily. Um, it's part of, the pl- of God's plan. If we look, now this is, I think, from J. John. That's from the Bible. This bit's from J. John. If Christmas is God with us, Easter is God for us, Pentecost is God in us, the Holy Spirit, Trinity, which we celebrate today, is us in God. But we need to go through Pentecost to receive the Holy Spirit so that we are part of the family of God. Now, I'm not one for icons in the church, but there is one icon that I really, really like, and it's Andre Rublev's The Trinity. It is a table with four sides. There are three people sat at the table, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there is a space on the other side of the table. And the purpose of the icon is to say, that actually, that space is for us, for us to go and join in with what God is doing, for us to go and be part of the Trinity, because we are made in his image. We are made to be relational. God is relational. We're relational. We need to be in relationship with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is who we celebrate today, yet in the church we focus too much on the individual characters of God and not focusing on who God really is. So I guess, are we willing to leave behind our ideas of what the church should be Are we willing to allow the Spirit to come and disrupt us? To allow the Spirit to come and shake us up so that the church can become something that Jesus wants it to be? A place where we come as a family to receive from God, to be fed on His Word, to then be able to go out and make a difference in the nation. I long to see the nation healed. I long to see the nation come back together. I long to see a move of God in this nation. But it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start with those of us that already know Jesus, that already have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And whilst that seems a big dream, we're told, dream big, be outrageous. As Paul tells us, God can do far more than we can ever ask or imagine. It is not beyond the realms of possibility that revival could break out in this land and it starts right here in Christchurch. It could happen. It might not happen. It might start somewhere else. It might not and probably won't even start in a church. Because the church is so messed up, the church is so human orientated that we've lost sight of what we actually do when we gather here on a Sunday. We have lost sight that we gather here to worship God, not just to have a nice time and leave with that warm, fuzzy feeling that I mentioned at the start. We don't just come along to hear something hopefully inspirational and then go out and do our own thing. We need to come to church to be filled up, to then go out and make a difference. And if we're not going out to make a difference, we're getting something wrong. And that is another reason why, as a church, we are going to start embarking on this season of mission and actually getting out into the community and doing stuff so that we are the visible church and that people see who we are, that we're not just a building, ideally placed in the community, but actually that we are a church who cares for the community. Why do we care for the community? Because we love Jesus, because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And we, when we are in that mode, going out into the community, God will respond. 
We will have to put ourselves in places we don't like. We will have to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones. We will have to do things we never dreamt possible. So we have to have faith. Because God will use each one of us for his glory. God will use each one of us when we go out there. Even if we don't see any, any results, we might have just planted that mustard seed. Because remember, it's not about the results. It's not about getting all of the community to come and gather in church. It's about showing people out there who the person of Jesus Christ is. Who God the Father is. Who God the Holy Spirit is. Because he's all interconnected. The world is in need of a father. I was sharing with somebody this week that wonderful scene in the shack. When we've had God the Father represented as, as the motherly figure. And then it comes to something really difficult. And Mac wakes up and says, you've changed today. He goes, yes, Mac, because today you need a father. We need to rediscover God as our father. Because the world needs to know that our father is trustworthy. We need to rediscover God the Holy Spirit. And not just think that's something for those people to deal with, to do. Because the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is moving. And we need to rediscover God, the Son, who went to the cross and died for us. Who wants to have a relationship with his world. People need to know that they need the Holy Spirit. What they're searching for out there with things like the occult, with addiction... It's trying to satisfy a need that will never be sat by, satisfied by anything of the world. It will only be satisfied when we know the Holy Spirit, which is through knowing God. So if we want to bring a change, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit ourselves so that we can go out and do what God is asking of us. It sounds quite doom and gloom in terms of the church, but the Holy Spirit is on the move in the church. Despite everything I've just said, the Holy Spirit is on the move. We can see that when we look at the figures and the stats. Church is growing. Do not let the media tell you the church is dying. The church will not die. The church will not die. The church is alive. We just have to look for those signs of growth and nurture them. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent his only son to die so that we may have eternal life. Do we know that Jesus? Or do we just know the Jesus who we think he is? The Jesus who we read about in the Gospels. Do we truly know who Jesus is? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit ready to do all that God has for us? Let's pray. Father, as we celebrated Pentecost last week and the pouring out of your Holy Spirit on your disciples, we pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit now. Pour out your Spirit on each one of us, Lord. We pray for more of your Holy Spirit than we've known before. So that through that encounter through the Holy Spirit living as we come to know Jesus for who he really is and that we come to know you as our father who is trustworthy who will not let us down who will guide us through the difficult times of this life we worship you father son and Holy Spirit as the Holy Trinity Come and fill us and take us to those places we never thought possible. Set your church on fire once again with love for you. Set our hearts on fire with love for you. I'm going to ask Emily to play Oceans. And as we, as we say, we're going to stay seated. But I just encourage you to use that as your prayer. Use that as your prayer to go to those places that you never thought possible, to see where God is asking of you in this season, 
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders, is what will be prayed. Let's make it our prayer for the church and for ourselves.